I'm honored to introduce the brave and courageous Heather Wright Rennick. Heather is the breast program coordinator and a breast nurse navigator for the Breast Center at St. Catherine Hospital in Garden City, Kansas. She worked at the St. Catherine Hospital for 17 years, first on the medical surgical floor and then in the intensive care unit. Heather was diagnosed in May 2012 with triple negative breast cancer, which required surgery and chemotherapy. After she completed her treatment and returned to work, she was offered the opportunity to start a breast program at St. Catherine Hospital. In the fall of 2013, she started working as the program coordinator and breast nurse navigator. She's here today to share her story with us. My name is Heather Wright Rennick. I was diagnosed with a stage one triple negative breast cancer at the ripe age of 33. Um, at that time, I'd been a nurse for 13 years and I was aware of the risk factors for breast cancer. I was aware of my family history, but I was still naive. I, I still didn't think I was gonna get breast cancer. If I was gonna get breast cancer, it wasn't gonna be at such a young age. And so that, that's the day that my breast cancer journey began. I remember driving home that day. I remember my husband was driving and I remember looking out the window and I just kept saying, I have breast cancer. I have breast cancer. Like, it was like a dirty word I was trying to, trying to spit out of my mouth. Um, it, it still took a while for it to sink into me. I work at a rural hospital in Western Kansas and we had many of the pieces that I needed for my breast cancer treatment, but we didn't have everything. So at that point, I had to drive three hours one way for surgical consult. I had to drive six hours one way for a genetic appointment. We had to drive 12 hours one way to go to a second opinion. And it was really important for me. I really wanted to, and I needed to. I wanted to come back home. I wanted to be at my home, in my community, surrounded by my family, with my friends, with my colleagues at a hospital that I trusted. I mean, I worked there. That's where I wanted to be. I needed to be back at home. So it was always about how can, I, how can I go back home? What can I do at home? I was happy to have access to all of those, to the big city information, but to be able to come back home and be with, be with, the, be with my tribe, be with my people. My daughter was a freshman. My, my son was a second grader. He was, he was six years old. Six, yeah, six years old. Like I said, my husband's a farmer. And so it wasn't feasible either for us to be six hours away, be three hours away, be 12 hours away. So we did what we had to out of the area and then we came back home and did what we could here. Um, I th when I think about my breasts at the beginning of my journey, when I think about what it was like, um, things that stick in my mind still today. I mean, I'm eight years into it, it's still a journey. Uh, when they say it's the, it's the journey, not the destination. Um, my journey, um, it still continues. Eight years later, I'm, I'm still going down this road I hope it doesn't end anytime soon. When it's when I think back to the things that um, that shaped, helped, help with my journey, helped guide me through, some key things stick out. Like I said, I was a nurse at that time for 13 years. And I remember feeling so overwhelmed and so scared and so frustrated. It was taking time to get my appointments made, and I was just sure something was going to go wrong or it was going to take too long, and I was it was I was going to grow it was going to grow rapidly, and I was going to die of breast cancer before anybody cared for me. One of my colleagues reminded me, you know, Heather, you're a nurse you, in, the, in the ICU, and you care for your patients every day, and you want them to trust you. You want your patients to trust you. You want their family to trust you. you you're trained, and you know what you're doing, and they put their trust in you. So now the tables are turned. Instead of you being the healthcare provider, you're now the patient, and you have to be, put trust in your healthcare providers. You have to trust the system that you've been part of. You have to trust that. And that was like a big aha moment for me. That was a time that I was like, you know, you're right. Like I'm not Heather the nurse right now. I'm Heather the patient. And so that really sticks in my mind. Something else that really um, sticks out to me still today and it, it does influence what I do today. I'm, I'm a breast patient navigator actually. And so what still guides me and something that is rings true with us every day is I'm lucky. I had in the insider connection. I had access to doctors when I had questions to other nurses that um, when, when I wasn't sure what something meant. You know, when I did that horrible thing and I Googled at the beginning of my journey and I was trying to figure out what everything meant, then I would lay in bed at night and I would think about all those things that I was reading. And I, would ha I was able to ask my, my friends, my colleagues, people I trusted. And so I always wonder, what happens if you're just a normal person? 
normal meaning. What happens if you're not a healthcare provider? What happens if you don't have those inside connections? Who do you go to and who do you ask all those random things that you don't understand? And so as we care for our breast patients with my job to navigate, to, to give them, to let them know it's okay to ask those questions, that we're here as a resource to them, to empower them, to advocate, advocate for their health, to ask those questions, and to know that we're available. Because don't, we don't want anybody to sit around and not have questions that they're afraid to ask or not have access. So that's something that still sticks with me today is, who do people outside of healthcare, who do they go to? Who do they ask? Who do they trust? Something else I remember along my journey is one day I was getting chemo and I was having some side effects and I hadn't said anything to my nurses. You know, there's so many things that go on in, in, in our heads we know, like you're going through chemo. It's, it's not gonna be all rainbows and butterflies. You're, there's gonna be things, you're fighting for your life. And I didn't wanna be whiny, like these are my friends too, but I didn't wanna be whiny. Like, is, does anybody really feel good during, during chemo? But finally, I, I, you know, um, my, my friend and my, my chemo nurse, said something and I told her. And she, she gently said, you know, Heather, we're, we're lucky to have you. Like you tell us these things, help us learn with you. We want our patients to tell us this because we want to be able to help you through it. And if you're experiencing this, there's probably other patients that are experiencing this and they're, they're afraid to speak up too. So you, this is your time. You, if you help us, and we can help you, but you can help us by speaking up to these side effects you're having, these things that you're experiencing, these things that you no one aren't normal, but you're uncomfortable saying, say them to us so that we can help our other patients too. So those are things I still think about today um, when we're educating our patients and, and talking through them and, and how can we help is to remember that there are some things that maybe people aren't comfortable talking about, but to just remind them is part of when speaking to them that, hey, these things are going on, it's okay. You might experience them, you might not experience them, but if you do speak up, advocate for your own health, don't be afraid to talk about it. Um, everybody's a little bit different. Everybody's gonna experience something. So please, please let us know what's really going on. And also to remember something I had to tell myself too is they, they want us to be able to continue our treatment. So if we, we need to tell them our side effects, those things that we're experiencing, so they can help us deal with the side effects so we can continue our treatment plan. Um, when I think about other things through my journey now, even eight years out, I think some people think that they're going to get diagnosed with cancer and then have their treatment and then boom, it's done and your life goes back to normal. But I say the only thing normal at my house is the dryer setting. Uh, this is a new normal. And, and I think it varies patient to patient. Some people are, might be able to have a reasonably normal um, after journey, but some of us still are very cognizant of the fact every day that cancer has changed our lives. I do remember too, um, at the end of my, I, I, I was that person. I thought I was gonna do my treatment and then I was gonna be back to the Heather I was on May 20th, the day before I was diagnosed. And so I've learned through time that I, I need to quit having unrealistic expectations. I need to quit trying to be who that was because this, I'm just a different version of myself and I like to think I'm a better version of myself. Um, I, I remember on my last chemo treatment, which is supposed to be like this big day, this big exciting day that I, I completed it and I'm, I'm able to live to tell about it, I remember crying. I remember being so scared because so far through my, at that, up to that point, you know, I'd had surgery and then I had my chemo treatments. So at that point, I'd been actively fighting for my life. I'd been actually, I've been actively progressive of doing something that I knew was gonna help me, hopefully. And so then all of a sudden it's done and also, because my, my treatment team were the people that I saw frequently that were supporting me that I could lean to, you know. I tried to be strong at home, um, but it's, it's hard to always not be strong. But I had two, two sets of little eyes from people I love, my kids, my husband and my siblings and looking at me all the time. And I wanted to be strong for them. But when I came to the cancer center, I just got to be Heather and I could unload all of it to them and they would help me carry it. So then all of a sudden, my last day of treatment, all of a sudden I'm like, I don't have access to you guys every day anymore. Um, who, what now? Like, how do I know that I'm still doing everything I need to do so that I can, so that I know I'm fighting off my cancer, that it's not going to come back, that I'm going to be okay. And to not have that, those people on your, by your side all the time. So that was another big thing that I was like, oh, I never thought I would be sad to be done with my treatment. But I wasn't sad to be done with my treatment. I was sad to leave the people that had helped me through my journey at that point. 
Um, I also, so when I say, you know, I tried to, at the cancer center, I could give my load to them and they'd help me carry it. And I tried to um, be strong at home and stuff. But I also didn't mask or try to hide everything because I was well aware of that there were other people watching me and God forbid my, my siblings would be diagnosed with cancer, or my children or, or anybody, my neighbors, my friends. I didn't want them to also have unrealistic expectations. Like this is very real. This is what happens. This is the, these are the things that you go through. And so um, more it was a, th this is what it's like, but to keep on going to one day at a time, one day at a time. I, I never tried to look beyond that one day at a time because I just needed to focus one day at a time and just, you know, to, to do that for myself to have a realistic goal, but to show others too that it, being diagnosed with a cancer isn't a, isn't a death sentence um, that you can, that it's possible to go through it. It just, it takes some time. And it also helps if you have some of the key components to help you through. I wrote an article for Conquer at the beginning of my journey too, that I still allude to today that um, so many times people are a number in a system. I, I, I feel, I feel bad maybe for people that are in a big system who are a number and maybe don't, um, not, they still get the care that they need, the treatment that they need, obviously. But I am not just a number. I'm a face. I'm very, I, I make it very real to a lot of people. I'm everybody's daughter or, or friend or next door neighbor or nurse. And so um, it makes it, I, I feel that personalized care. I feel like it, that it's, it's un, my care was unique to me. I also think if people have the, the key components too in their lives, that it makes um, your breast cancer journey, journey. but just it made, it made it possible. When you have friends, family, church, community, school, and work, when you have those six components that are surrounding you, it makes it so that it, it, it's doable. When, when, you're, when you're constantly surrounded by all of those things, it really helps you stay more positive and helps you focus your eye on the prize so that you can get to where you're going. I also, um, part of this journey, I've realized that breast cancer isn't the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I, I wouldn't want to do it again if I don't have to. I don't, I don't wish it upon anybody, but some of my greatest blessings have come from breast cancer. And one of those blessings is the community of other, my breast friends breast cancer patients that I've met because of this and that we are able to support each other through our breast friends, people that have lived the journey, that they know the journey, that they understand that if you send a text message and you're like, man, um, my brain is just fried today. I can't, I feel like, I, I don't feel like I'm going to ever be back to normal. They're like, I understand that this is happening too. Or, hey, it's time for my scan and I'm just really nervous, even though I'm eight years out for them to be like, you got this, like, it's okay, it's normal to feel, it's normal to feel this anxiety. Um, to, just to have those breast friends that understand everything you've gone through. That's one of my, the biggest blessings that's come through it. It's like a, we're like a part of a, a part of a group that nobody wants to be part of, but once you're in it, you're, you're in it for life. Also, um, after I did all my care and I finished my treatment and I came back to work, then I realized um, my heart just felt different. And I, and working in the ICU, I've been a med surge nurse, a chemo nurse, a sexual assault nurse, and then like the ICU nurse. And then I came back to work and it was just different. You're, you're a changed person, like I said. And so my organization approached me about starting a breast program. And I'm like, okay, like, what does that look like? And so to take all those pieces of the things that we had here, and then what did I have to go elsewhere to do? And what did they have that was good? And so to bring it all back here, to build a breast program for, for our community so that everybody in this area can have comprehensive breast care close to home. Like I said, we live in the rural area and you shouldn't have to travel three hours or six hours or 12 hours to get the care that you need, is what I believe. We have teachers, we have farmers, we have people that live three hours away that depend on their, depend on a ride to come get them to where they're going. So to be able to provide this care in Western Kansas was, has been huge to me. You don't. It, so I'm a navigator. You, you don't have to be a breast can. You don't have to be a breast cancer survivor in order to be a good navigator. Um, but it does. I have a connection with a lot of our patients when they're going through and they're at a dark time. And if you know they come to me, to just be able to say, to, for me to understand and be empathetic and to um, to help them through it. It's it's been it's as good for me as it is for them. I think.
so with COVID, when COVID struck, struck all of us, I think it's so hard because, so one, we tell everybody, get your screenings, get your screenings, get your screenings, get your screenings, early detection will save lives. And then all of a sudden we say, okay, pause for a minute. Don't get your screenings right now. We need to focus. It's not because your screenings weren't important and because we didn't want to do them. It's because the focus at that time was, was let's get you, let's get through COVID. This is the bigger concern. So now to, now that people pause now to say, okay, now let's come back into it and to get those people back into their screenings. It's something that we, that we worry about. We don't want people that delayed their, their screenings to not come back and get, get them now because we don't want them to just be further behind and further behind. So to encourage everybody to be getting their screenings on time. Um, also for our patients that had known that were diagnosed with breast cancer that were waiting for their care. Such a COVID was high anxiety producing anyway. And now they have a breast cancer and what are we having to do different to um, change your plan so that we can deal with COVID and still treat you. And so that just takes a lot of just education on um, the provider's parts and patients, um, uh, you know, patients from uh, the patients, patients from the patients to, for them to, um, it feels like it's a medical emergency when you have breast cancer, but it's more, usually it's more of an emotional emergency for, so for just to um, educate them, reiterate the fact that, you know, we have guidelines and we're, we're following them and we know we need to do this by this time and this by this time. And also to, um, we want you to stay healthy. Like if you're in the middle of chemo and the last thing we want you to do is have a unnecessary exposure. We don't want to kick you while you're down. So to put your health first so we can get you through the rest of it. Um, also the, the financial toxicity that comes with having breast cancer as well. Then how does COVID look like that? So what, you know, not just to be keeping you healthy, but what other needs have come up because of COVID? Um, have they lost their job? Has their spouse lost their job? Do they need help with um, gas cards to get to and from work? Do they need help with healthcare expenses? Do they just need somebody to talk to because they're so anxious about everything, they're scared? Those changes that come from COVID. Something else that I've um, tried, that I've learned through my journey is as healthcare providers, like we, it's not like I just learn these things, you just see them differently and, and it, it just hits differently. Is It's so important for patients to speak up about their health in um, their body. Patients get mammograms, they go to their providers to get clinical breast exams. Um, but we live with our breast every day. Like we have our breast, we know what they are, we know, hopefully we know what they look like, we know what they feel like, we know. And so when a change comes up, we know what's different. When you go to your provider, like think about your provider sees you once a year probably and they see how many breasts. And so you carry your breast with you, if you carry your breast with you all the time. So you need, if you have a change, you to speak up for it, that to not um, just always depend on our healthcare providers to find it for us. If you notice a change, it's okay to say, hey, I have this lump and it, it wasn't there before. Or um, yeah, I know we are watching this lump in um, it just feels different now. I hear so many times, and I was myself guilty of it. I, ha I had a lump and it was changing and I thought, ah, it's gonna, it's gonna go away. It's, um, I'm 33, it's small. But for me to be able to be like, no, like this feels different. It, it, you know, I, it's, it wasn't like this before. I need to get in, I need to get seen, I need to talk about it. For the patients that tell us that or I didn't notice it or I thought, you know, I thought my doctor would be the one to find it, it's okay to speak up when you notice a difference about your body to say, hey, this just isn't right. You know, this is me. I feel uncomfortable. Um, can I can I please be seen about this? Can we please talk about it? These are my risk factors. And also to know your family history, um, to know who it is that had cancer and what kind of cancer and, you know, to know what age. Some people don't have access to their family history and that's okay too. But if you know your family history, to make sure that you are um, sharing that with your provider. And to remember your family history changes. When you see, I, you see your doctor today, in the next 365 days, what happens? Um, maybe your mom's diagnosed with a breast cancer, maybe your grandma, maybe your grandpa gets a prostate. Those things change. So as you go to your yearly appointments, to make sure you're updating that information so that, that they can be doing the risk stratification so they can be knowing, hey, this is what my family history and this is how it's changed. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my journey. I am grateful for everybody that has traveled this journey along with me, that, is, that have educated me, supported me, shared their stories, 
that has been vulnerable with me. And to um, please always remember that um, it might, might be hard right now, but there's better times ahead and, and just hang on and, and keep going.